Hello my lovely students and welcome to part three of what was meant to be one video. So I clearly talk way too much. I thought it'd be useful to start off with a new map that I've made of the labours of Heracles using my old mythological map on uh, the Greek Myth Comics website. We've already looked at the first six of the labours of Heracles in the previous video, which was literally labelled part two. And in this video, we'll be going over the next six of the labours. Remember, they were originally meant to be 10 and he ended up doing 12. So, labour seven. The bull of Crete, the Cretan bull. So obviously, he now has to go to where there is a Cretan bull. That is Crete. That is going to be not in Greece mainland, but the island of Crete far below it. So he's finally left, really, uh, the mainland of, of Greece, the, the Peloponnese. Um, yes, Crete has a lot of bull stories. We know the Minoans worshipped bulls. We know that there was some kind of ritual, maybe bull leaping, as is shown in frescoes in, of both the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. We see bulls still being revered by the Mycenaeans, or at least you will, my class, next year when you study that. And so this bull is indeed meant to be linked with all those other bull stories, including the story of the Minotaur. So this bull story... He has to go and get the Cretan bull from Crete to Mycenae. This bull has been destroying homes and farmland and King Minos is happy to let him remove it. So this bull is probably the bull that, okay, bear with me here, that King Minos had asked for from Poseidon. It was meant to be a big white bull. But he basically said, Poseidon, send me something that I could sacrifice to you to prove that I would sacrifice it to you. And so Poseidon sends him this bull and he doesn't sacrifice it, thus not proving that he would have done that. And in retaliation, the bull is uh, made to be seen as a figure of passion by Minos's wife, Pasiphae. And she goes to Daedalus, who has escaped Athens, and who is working for Minos to build him his palace. And um, Pasiphae says to Daedalus, make me a cow suit, please. There's this bull I want to seduce. And he does, because she's the queen. And so she and the bull have a baby, and it's the Minotaur. And then the bull wanders off and starts laying waste to everything. And that's when uh, it becomes a problem. <laughs> well, obviously, the bit where Minos now has a baby who is half bull and half man is obviously a problem for him. Um, but luckily, he's got Daedalus on hand who then builds him a big maze at the place of the labrys, the labyrinth, in order to contain this weird child that he now has and wants to hide. Because apparently it's carnivorous too. Everything bad is carnivorous here. So, this bull, right? Um, yeah, I mean, look at it. It's very, very manly, this bull. Um, so Heracles apparently strangles the bull enough to knock it out and then carries somehow the bull all, all the way back to Greece and um, and then shows it to Eurystheus. Again, Eurystheus is terrified and jumps into his pithos just like he did with the Aramanthian boar. And then Heracles lets the bull loose and then it starts waging um, problematic warfare on the land all the way to marathon and it becomes the marathonian bull yeah so um that's problematic uh in itself because it kind of creates another myth anyway the only reason why they say it's the same bull because it makes the myth sound better doesn't it really so in this metope we've got a different shape being made. In the fourth metop on the West End, Heracles is taming the bull. So we get a good moment of the story with lots of action in it. We've got the bull on one side, rearing up, sort of crossing behind Heracles, and Heracles on the other side, about to turn and wallop it, it looks like. Not exactly strangle it, but he's got to, you know, calm it somehow. And because we've got these two diagonally placed figures, no, there's, there's a cross that they make, they fill the whole metope as the bull tries to escape to the right. The hero has his club in his right hand, checks the bull and drags it back with a rope he has tied to its muzzle. The background of the metope would have been painted blue and the bull a chestnut red, so it really would have stood out. And they know this from traces of paint that have been left on. I think we looked at that earlier in the year. So this X shape shows that they are fighting. We'll see this again on, on other metopes um, 
uh, throughout the year when we look at the Cent uh, Centaur Mackie and Amazon Mackie and all those lovely fights we see on um, uh, temple artwork, we see this X shape uh, created by characters who are in opposition. They are fighting. And so even though the bull has been caught, it's still rearing up. So it's still an exciting moment. And we can see the fact that Heracles has his arm raised, sort of echoes the movement of the bull rearing up. But his left hand has got the bull uh, caught in a rope that he has tied around his muzzle. So it is tame. So we know this comes from the middle of the story. This is presumably when he's trying to get it back to mainland Greece. So here's what it looks like. You can really see the X shape here. Um, it's a really instantly recognisable scene because it's got the bull and the bull is such a huge figure here. Realism in the scene is created by the X shape and ooh, look at this. They're making eye contact. It's exciting. And the X shape is what has filled the space so as not to leave any blank spaces really uh, in this very exciting image. The Horses of Diomedes. Now, there is a Diomedes in the Iliad, but this is a different Diomedes. This is the king of the Bistones race in Thrace. And apparently, this king, his horses are carnivorous. Yes, I bet you guessed that already. So they were so strong and crazy because he fed them with um, the limbs of his enemies and apparently passing strangers. That's bad, Xenia. That's bad hospitality. So Diomedes is a wrong un, right? He's a bad guy. Um, these horses are kept tethered and they have uh, chains on them as well. So they're really, really strong. That's the only thing. You don't normally chain a horse, right? So they have to be chained. And so um, he has to go and get the horses from Diomedes. Diomedes is not going to like this. And in fact, when Heracles arrives, um, he defeats the people who were looking after the horses, the stablemen, I presume, and starts to take the horses away. And then um, Diomedes sets out with his men to go and get the horses back back. Now apparently this is another one where Heracles has got a friend with him. This time a chap called Abderos. And Abderos is one of these characters who we meet and then he dies because Hercules, sorry, oh dear me, Heracles goes off to fight Diomedes and leaves Abderos in charge of the horses and they eat him. Poor old Abderos. <laughs> so in retaliation, Heracles defeats Diomedes and then feeds Diomedes to his own horses. That's quite a satisfying ending, really. And then by eating their master, the horses are like magically calmed. And so he's able to take them back to Eurystheus. Um, and uh, we are told that there are different versions of the story. One account suggests that the horses are now free to roam the plains of Argos and uh, be tamed and used by the people there. Um, and other people say that they're, that they're set free, but they go to Olympus and then they're killed by wild animals. I just don't see the point <laughs> in that second version of the story. I mean, what, like, we're going to punish the horses now by having them killed by some wild animals. Anyway, I'm getting very opinionated. So Heracles is shown here in this image, taming the man-eating horses of Diomedes, king of the Thracians, or at least one of them. The hero grasps with his left hand what were probably the bronze reins of a galloping horse, as in they probably were actually bronze on the met, hopes so they're not there anymore, while his raised right hand would probably have been holding his club because that's what it looks like he's holding. It's normally what he's holding. Only the head of the horse has actually survived in the upper right corner. Um, again, we've got that X shape. So it's actually really similar to the bull metope in that we've got the same kind of thing. He's leaning over about to do something with his right hand while his left hand holds the reins, just like in the boar uh, metope. And the animal is kind of rearing up behind him. So again, that battle shown by the X shape. But Heracles this time is much more central, showing he's he's much more important here, whereas previously it almost looked like he and the boar were equals, making that eye contact. If we look at what's actually left, yeah, they really have just got a bit of the horse. But you can see where his arm came across. So easily recognisable scene. Well, it's got a horse in it. So it's the horse one. 
Um, realism in the scene, yeah, well, it was quite dynamic. That X shape create, you know, makes them look like they're fighting. And the X shape is also useful for filling the space so as not to leave any blank spaces. So we're coming up to the last few here. The Belt of Hippolyta, the Amazon Queen. So you might have heard of Hippolyta because you might well have read or studied or seen performed A Midsummer Night's Dream. And in fact, Theseus and Hippolyta are the frame narration characters really in that play. It's probably not exactly the right term to use, but it's their wedding that is meant to be going on and it starts and ends the entire play, the wedding of Theseus and Hippolyta. It's actually set in Athens and it's after Theseus has um, uh, conquered Hippolyta and married her. And that is linked with this particular story, kind of, depending on which version, because in some version with the Hippolyta dies and other version she doesn't. Um, there's also uh, familiar if you have studied the play Hippolytus, which my students haven't, but some of you might. And in this play, the son of Theseus and Hippolyta, Hippolytus, is a young man who worships Artemis and hates all other women. And Theseus's new wife, Phaedra, desires him and she's a bit naughty and she wants to have sex with him and he says no. So she tells Theseus that his son raped her and then Theseus curses his son and then he finds out too late that his wife was lying and his son's already dead. So Hippolyta is quite a famous name here and she is in fact queen of the Amazons, one of the queens of the Amazons. There are several throughout myth. So this is kind of a problematic story because there's an awful lot of misunderstanding in it. So the um, Amazons were meant to be, as we know, this race of female warriors, but they were actually not meant to live in Greece. They were meant to live somewhere off uh, near the Black Sea. Thus, they are difficult to get to. So he's going to take a long time to travel to these. Apparently, um, she, Hippolyta, has this magical belt. And Eurystheus, who clearly is like just having a bit of an issue like oh my god what do i what do i do he's defeated everything else i don't know and then his daughter goes i want the bell of hippolyta queen of the amazons he's like brilliant you are a genius daughter and so he sends heracles to go and get this belt for his daughter again it's quite demeaning saying go on this errand find it for me bring it back Heracles goes and apparently he takes a bit of an army with him. Apparently he did this with Diomedes as well, just in case, does not quite well. Or at least with Diomedes he has at least that one poor friend, Abderos. Don't forget his name. Heracles is travelling there and he's thinking, well, how on earth do I get the belt of this queen who's never done anything to me? I'm not going to like strangle her and carry her back. But it turns out Hippolyta's a big fan She's heard about Heracles and she thinks he's really cool. So he gets there and there's this awkward moment. He's like, hi, I've, I've got to get your belt. He's like, wow, you can have it. Oh my God, I'm part of the legend. And so apparently she gives him her belt. And that was easy, wasn't it? So Hera gets involved and messes it up, of course. We haven't really heard from Hera a lot, but she's the one who got him into this mess in the first place. And apparently she takes on the form of one of the Amazons and she starts spreading rumours that Heracles is actually not planning to get the belt, but he's using the belt as bait to get the queen. And it's all a big conspiracy. And so then when they hear this, the Amazons immediately react and they ride out and they attack Heracles. And seeing the Amazons arriving from a distance, Heracles thinks that they have been scheming all along to attack him. You see where this misunderstanding has come in. And so they fight. Now, in one version of the story, as we can see in the metope here, Heracles kills Hippolyta. In other versions of the story, he captures Hippolyta and then she gets given by him to his mate Theseus as a bride. There are, in fact, two wars with the Amazons. The first one is caused by the belt and the second one is caused by him giving her to his mate as a bride. Anyway, let's focus on this metope. So the last metope on the West End depicts the slaying of the Amazon Hippolyta in order to get her famous girdle, which is an old fashioned word for belt. The fallen Amazon tries to protect herself with her shield in her left hand as Heracles prepares to strike her a blow with his club. It's in a very fragmentary condition, this metope, like many of the other ones. Now here we've got again that upside down V shape. We raise our eye up from Hippolyta 
to Heracles, who is smack bang in the middle, and then down the other side. She's on the floor, defeated, just like we saw the Nemean lion right back in Metope 1. He's almost lazily swinging his, uh, actually looks like a bat there rather than a club, swinging his club down on her, even though she has her shield raised. She doesn't seem to have anything else with which to defeat him. And so she does look like she's about to die, or at least to be captured. Here's what it looks like now. And my horribly bright yellow box, I'm sorry, is what I was saying before. Uh, this is part one of the Amazon Amaki, the war against the Amazons. His request for the belt being misjudged and war ensuing. And then there is another part of the Amazon Amaki where he gives his pal Theseus, the Amazon Queen Hippolyta, as a bride. And that starts the second Amazonian war, the Amazon Amaki. So we can only even just see bits of poor old Hippolyta on the floor there and bits of her shield. It's not only fragmentary, but it's been worn down over time. Although uh, Heracles's face and his knee are in excellent condition. Um, easily recognisable, but it's got a woman in it. It would have been much easier to see that it was a woman. As you saw in the previous thing, they made her breasts very obvious. Or at least that's the thought. Um, realism in the scene, again, the way he's standing over her and filling the space, not doing blanks. Again, we've got that upside down V shape. Both of those things create realism and fill the space with that upside down V. Oh, right. So Geryon. Now he's an interesting dude. So the triple bodied monster Geryon is apparently a guy with three bodies, which sounds a lot like just three guys, because he's also got three heads, right? So, okay. Anyway, um, this one as well is not in Greece. He goes, where is he going? He's going all the way uh, to, gosh, where is he? Oh, we don't even know. He's just off the map, basically. We haven't really got a location. The ends of the earth is basically where he has to go for this one. And that was just oh, away from the Mediterranean. So, Eurystheus tasked Heracles with fetching the cattle that belonged to Geryon. They were very famous. They were really, really red. Um, that's nice, isn't it? They apparently don't eat people this time for once. To steal the cattle, um, Heracles would have to actually defeat the herdsman and the herdsman dog. And the herdsman is an ordinary herdsman. He is Eurytion, and he is very, very careful. And the dog is no ordinary dog. It is Orthrus, brother of Kerberus. So Kerberus has got three heads, right? Guess how many heads Orthrus have? Two. The two-headed dog. That's why we clearly never hear about him, because he's only got two heads. And obviously three heads is way better than three heads. And as I say this, I'm actually looking at a statue of Kerberus I have on my desk. So yeah, three heads is clearly better. But anyway, you can imagine a two-headed dog, two noses. He's going to sniff you out. So that's going to be difficult. So Heracles beats them with his club. Job done. And he starts to take the cattle away. And Geryon finds out what's happening, rushes down there, all three bodies of him, and starts trying to use his three sets of arms to hack back at Heracles. And finally, Heracles is successful in clubbing some of Geryon and shooting other bits of Geryon and finally defeating Geryon. And there is a story that we will read in the Roman version of this that happens while he's leading the cattle of Geryon back to Greece because he has to take them all the way back to Mycenae, for goodness sake. And when he brings them back to Eurystheus, Eurystheus sacrifices the bulls to Hera. Oh, she's doing well out of this, isn't she? In this metope, Heracles is striking a mortal blow, meaning the death blow, at the three-bodied monster Geryon, whose cattle he must take to Eurystheus. This scene shows Heracles in the left part of the metope, about to strike off the third head of Geryon, whom he has not yet vanquished. Geryon is portrayed with three joined bodies, each of them armed with a shield, helmet and breastplate. So I think here I've outlined it to try and make it clear. So there's Heracles. He's easy to make out with his club. And then we've got one, two, and three heads of Geryon. And one kind of body. All the heads are pointing down, which shows defeat. And they're all wearing armour, including Heracles, in fact. But it does rather look like Geryon is one guy with two guys falling down behind him. 
In any case, the fact that there are three heads does make this uh, recognisable straight away. Filling the space, we've got Heracles filling up the left-hand side, and he's in motion, which is quite dynamic and interesting. And then we've got the three heads of Geryon taking up most of the right-hand side, right down to the floor. So that does fill the space quite well. In terms of realism, the fact that they've got armour and we can see their bodies, that certainly gives us a sense that this is a, a real set of actions happening, and these are real characters. It looks realistic I suppose from a distance. Here's what it now looks like. So we can really quite clearly see Heracles on the left and then we've got this lovely upside down face. What you can really see here is the heads of Geryon seem to have been quite stylized to look a bit OTT over the top, a bit like maybe dramatic masks, even comedy masks, because Geron's the bad guy and he's meant to be sort of weird, having three heads, so he's kind of monstrous. So he looks a bit, uh, a bit like the centaurs look like um, in the um, Centaurimachi, which we haven't studied yet. So you'll, you'll notice that then. So as we said before, easily recognisable. There would have been three heads of Geryon painted up there. Created realism in the scene. Yep, there's lots of action, dynamic movement, and fill the space. Heracles on the left and Geryon on the right, all three heads of him. And this comical, exaggerated features, as I pointed out already. Ah, Atlas and the apples of the Hesperides. You'll notice immediately a woman on the left-hand side. Again, this is Athene. So this is another one where, because Athene's there, we know he, he manages to do this with his cleverness. Um, so the Hesperides were meant to be at the end of the earth and there is a garden here and in the garden grow the golden apples which the earth Gaia presented as a wedding gift to Zeus and Hera and they are guarded by the Hesperides nymphs who are daughters of Atlas the titan who holds up the world. So there's a lot of mythology here. Um, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco are named after Atlas. They were deemed to have been the place where the world was being held up. So this is possibly where this task was meant to have occurred. I believe one of these apples, which are also meant to be golden, is one of the uh, is the kind of apple that that Eris or Strife nicked and threw into the wedding of Peleus and Thetis to mess it up, and that was the golden apple. And that was for the fairest. So Heracles' task, and we're on to number 11 now, I think, because um, two tasks were disqualified. Uh, the Lernian Hydra, because he got help from his um, nephew, Iolaus. And, oh yeah, the Augean Stables, because he was going to get paid for it. Um, so, you know, like I said, Eurus is just making up the rules here. No, uh, I'm going to give you another one. He's got to. Heracles isn't dead. That's what he wanted, right? So I know... Go and get the apples from the Hesperides. Go please and fetch these mythical golden apples from the end of the world. That should do it. Heracles doesn't know where the garden is, so that's obviously going to add some time. He's got to walk around the world to, to find it. And he apparently ends up somewhere called uh, Illyria. And he has to fight a river called Achelous. A river god. Again, that's going to be in one of the Ovid Metamorphoses stories that we're going to read in the Roman side of this topic. And then he ends up at Mount Caucasus, and that's where the Titan Prometheus is changed. You remember him um, from reading uh, your myth book earlier in the year. Prometheus is chained up there, and he takes pity on Prometheus. Heracles is given a reward for killing the eagle when he takes pity on Prometheus. And Prometheus says, thanks for killing the eagle. You all know where the Garden of the Hesperides is. And he gives him direction. So um, now he knows where to go. And he also tells him how to get the apples. So Heracles then goes to Atlas. Now he knows where Atlas is, who's holding up the world or the sky. Either way, he's holding it up. And instead of just saying, can you get your daughters to give me the apples? He tricks Atlas into just going and getting them for him. Hey, man. I'll hold up the sky for you if you go and get me the apples, right? Fair trade. And Atlas, whose back hurts by now, is really happy with this idea. So he goes and gets the apples. So Heracles doesn't even need to go to the Hesperides and sneak past the nymphs and get the apples. 
Atlas then thinks he can trick Heracles. So when he gets back, he says, hey, man, I've got the apples. He probably didn't say, hey, man, I'm sorry, I'm getting lazy. Hey, I have these apples that you wanted. Why don't I deliver them for you? Ha ha. Then he doesn't have to keep holding up the world. And Heracles is clever. Um, look, Athene's there to show us that Heracles is clever. And he goes, oh, OK, but I tell you what, if I'm going to hold the sky a bit longer, I need a, a, a cushion. Can you just hold it for a second while I go and get a cushion? And then I'll come back and use the cushion and hold up the sky. And then you can go and give him the apples. And Atlas is like, yeah, that's fine. And takes the sky back. And Heracles grabs the apples and runs. So well done, Heracles. He gets away. They were not allowed to stay with King Eurystheus, these apples, because they belonged to Zeus. Gave them to Athene and apparently she took them back to the Garden of the Hesperides for him. So that's nice. She's clearly quite keen on him at this point. In this metope, the best preserved and one of the finest of the metopes is that portraying the myth of the apples of the Hesperides. It contains three figures. In the centre, Heracles is turned to the right as with an effort he holds up the sky on his shoulders. So you can see he actually already has a pillow there. Hmm. Oops. On the left, behind Heracles, Athene is with a tranquil expression, assists him, easily supporting part of the sky with one arm while holding her spear with her right hand. So that kind of suggests that she is actually helping him hold up the sky. In front of Heracles stands Atlas, who has brought back the golden apples guarded by the Hesperides nymphs and offers them to him with both hands. And so we get apparently this beautiful figure of Athene and it says the divine and at the same time tranquil figure of Athene is superb, says the person who wrote this, um, this guide. We've got Heracles smack bang in the middle, holding up the sky. The fact that Athene is standing right next to him and that he's in the middle is all that could possibly tell us that this is him because this, the figure of Atlas is very, very similar. The fact that the figure of Atlas is also holding the apples and giving them to the man in the middle would suggest that it's Atlas rather than Heracles because we know the story. So we do kind of need to know the story quite well to understand what's happening here. Um, this figure of Heracles is really realistic because the muscles are all very, very taut as if he really would be holding up the sky. And so he's using his strength. And again, Athene is there representing his cleverness. So we've got strength and cleverness. You can see why he's such an appealing hero. Here we really do have a very well-preserved scene. The sculptor has created an easily recognisable scene. Well, the apples look really small, but you're sure you probably would have been able to see them from the ground the way they were painted. And the position that Heracles is in, he's clearly holding something up. It must be the sky. The realism in the scene is created by the really beautifully done figures. And the, f the whole space is full because we have, just like we did in the very first metope, we've got three characters filling that whole space. There are the apples, by the way. There's the pillow. And um, you can just make out there is actually meant to be a sort of a ball that he is holding up. And that's the earth. But he's on the earth. So is it the sky? But isn't the sky a dome? No, it's a ball. They didn't know how to represent this. It's difficult. So the fact that they've tried at all is, is just at least making the myth work in this scene. And finally, gosh, that was loud. Sorry. Um, Kerberos. Oh God, you're back. I sent you to the edge of the world and you came back. I sent you to get mythical apples. You've actually brought them to me. Um, You can see where Eurystice is going with this. Why don't you just go to the underworld and bring me back Kerberos, right? Oh, do you know what? I've actually got two models of Kerberos on my desk. I must really love this dog. Um, Eurystice doesn't love this dog. He doesn't really want Kerberos in his house, but he wants Heracles gone. He quite literally has said, go to hell. So he does. Now, this is quite good for Heracles because only the best heroes actually go to the underworld. And so we've got Hermes in this image because Hermes is the psychopomp. He brings the souls of the dead into the underworld. He is the only god, aside from Hades, who transverses between Olympus and the underworld. So Hermes as a psychopomp is appropriate in this image. Again, then we don't have much of him and they've drawn this shadowy figure with his big hat. Um, so he looks a bit like, well, he looks a bit like the one in the in the very first scene with the, uh, with the Nemean lion in this metope. So go and get Kerberos from the underworld. No problem. Um, and in fact, uh, Odysseus 
goes to the underworld, as you know from the uh, journeying to the underworld topic, and I read you a section of that. I don't think I've read you the bit with Hercules, though. And he, he sees Heracles in the underworld, which is weird, right? Because Heracles is not going to underworld. He's going to get deified later. But anyway, no matter, Homer, let's forget that happened, all right? It's not canon, clearly. Um, and in the in Odyssey, book 11, uh, Heracles tells Odysseus that Eurystheus, that Eurystheus sent me down here to go and get the dog. So we, we know about this myth from Homer as well as from other versions of the myth. He's got to do something clever. He can't just go down and take the dog. They're not going to allow that. So he has to try and, well, what's he going to do? Do I gain the favour of Hades? Oh, how do you do that? I know. I'll gain the favour of Hades' wife. In order to gain favour with Persephone, he goes and gets himself initiated into the Eleusinian Mysteries. Now, we did talk about that when we read the Homeric Hymn to Demeter. Um, the Eleusinian Mysteries, much as we don't know exactly what they did in this mystery cult, the clue is in the name, we do know it was dedicated to the worship of Demeter, and Demeter is Persephone's mum, and it happened at Eleusis, which is nearby to Athens. So he gets initiated there into these mysteries. He becomes an initiate and then he then goes to the underworld and Persephone and Hades then greet him, knowing him to be an initiate. He's done that on purpose in order to gain their favour. And they present him with a challenge. If you can capture Kerberos without using weapons, you can take him to Eurystheus. Guess what clever thing he does? He's done it with several other animals already. He uses his stranglehold uses his brute strength and don't forget there are three heads here he's got to subdue he somehow uses the stranglehold on all three heads of the three-headed dog nice so he takes Kerberos out of the underworld which is what we can see in this metope it's almost like he's dragging him out that lead is taut Kerberos does not want to go I'm sure those of you with dogs are familiar with this you said you wanted to go for a walk. Now you're lying there tired and you won't move. What do you want? He clearly needs a bag of treats or something similar. And he brings him to Eurystheus. And you can imagine Eurystheus is thrilled. And then he brings them back because you can't be just keeping Kerberos. He's got to guard the underworld from other random mortals like you who want to get in. So in the, the final metop, the place before the last one at the east is occupied by the metop, which depicts Heracles wearing a short cloak, because it's cold in the underworld, and dragging Kerberos with a rope out of Hades, as in the place, not the person. Hermes, the conductor of souls, psychopomp, may also have been present. Basically, there's another figure there, and it does look like from this drawing that they were able to see a section of um, Hermes' staff. So it could well be Hermes, and that would make a lot of sense. You know, he is linked with the underworld. Kerberos is portrayed here with only one head, which was usual in earlier iconography. Although I just like to think it's one head because the other two are next to it. And so, you know, they didn't really have 3D. Um, and the metope is very fragmentary. All right. Again, we've got this X shape, but not because they're fighting. Although... Her, Heracles is fighting with the dog, but he's not fighting with Her Hermes. So it's not a complete fight like the other one. But again, this, this cross shape fills the space. The uh, space is full of detail. There should be two L's there, sorry. And Heracles is clearly in charge. That dog is going to move. All right. He just, he just, he just is going to have to get used to that idea. Um, this metope has got quite a lot of Heracles left and you can see where it's tinted uh, on the um, on the, the marble where it would have been painted. You can still see the traces of it and we can see most of Kerberos's lovely face and uh, another foot which suggests there was another person in the scene. It would also make sense for there to be another person in the scene because it would balance out with Heracles. So easily recognisable, Heracles is pulling a dog. That's an easy one. Created realism in the scene. Yup, you've got that cross shape and they're bending away from each other and everyone knows what it's like to try and get a dog to do what a dog doesn't want to do. And they fill the space by using that X shape. So we come to the end of the metopes and now we just look at that bit about Olympia that I said before because Heracles Finav actually has a shrine at Olympia. So Olympia, yes, that Olympia, the home of the Olympian Games or the Olympic Games, 
was a city in the west of the Peloponnese. There we go. You can see Elis. You remember Algiers? Yeah, I'm coming up with him again. Uh, Heracles is cited as one of the founders of the Olympic Games. There is another founder of the Olympic Games who is cited as being Pelops, who I will tell you the story of on the next slide. And both stories are commemorated on the Temple of Zeus at Olympus, which we studied in the temple's topic and we did look briefly at the artwork on it. So we're not saying that one is right and one is wrong and there's not like some people who believe one is right and the other people is wrong. We believe that both are right and happened at different times and maybe added to what the first one had done, that kind of thing. So basically we do find Heracles kind of worshipped here in art form. So Pelops. Pelops seems to have come first. Um, I drew this comic when I was at Olympia, when we did our Greek trip, to tell the story of Pelops. And it was inspired by the artwork on the um, pediment, uh, on the eastern pediment of the temple. So King Onomaios loved his daughter Hippodamia and he would not part with her. He wouldn't let anyone marry her. Um, and he and his wife Sterope lived with their daughter Hippodamia in Olympus. Onomaeus forced every suitor for Hippodamia's hand to compete in a chariot race with him. And if it looked like they were going to win, Onomaeus would cheat and he would kill them with a spear throw. So basically, they weren't going to win. And if they were challenged to a chariot and they took him up on it, they were going to die. And this way he stopped Hippodamia getting married. Pelops, who I won't tell you the whole story of, but um, it's quite interesting. At one point he gets eaten by some of the gods by accident. And so he's got, he's actually got a fake shoulder made by Hephaestus. So he's an interesting cat, uh, chap. Um, so Pelops becomes a suitor for Hippodamia's hand. He also sees that the king's groomsman or, or chariot wrangler, uh, Myrtilos, also loves Hippodamia, but he hasn't got a hope in hell because he's the wrong status. So Pelops comes up with a plan. He says to Myrtilos, cripple the king's chariot and let me win and you'll get one night with Hippodamia. Poor old Hippodamia clearly doesn't get a say in this. And Myrtilos agrees and Pelops' plan is set. So Myrtilos replaced Onomaeus' wheel pins with plugs of wax so they would look like pins. But when the race began, the wax would melt and Onomaeus would be thrown from the chariot and hopefully die or at least really lose and then he wouldn't be able to stop them getting married and this is exactly what happened and he did die so um that meant that Pelops had actually won and everyone was really amazed because someone had won the hand of Hippodamia and now the king was dead so hey I guess you get Hippodamia and you get the crown that's cool but Pelops is a shady old guy here well young guy and Myrtilos comes to him and asks for his reward one night with Hippodamia. And Pelos proved untrue and he pushes him off a cliff and into the sea. Um, I'm not sure how easy that is because it's not that close to the sea to be honest. Basically, as Myrtilos dies in this version he drowns, he curses Pelops. He says, you broke your word. I curse you and yours forever. And this curse does in fact affect Pelops' future generations, including the sons of Atreus. Uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon and Agamemnon ends up dying in a bath murdered by his own wife so you know these things have legs these curses so after he had won Pelops apparently set up the Olympic Games as funeral games for Oenomaeus that way he tried to assuage some of his guilt in having him killed funeral games were very very common we see them in the Iliad uh, we even I think we see them in we see them in Aeneid as well, but they're copying the Iliad. Um, the idea is that oh, a great person has died, and you have games in their honour, and people win stuff that belonged to them as in memory. And you can see how this might actually have turned into over time the Olympic Games if it became a regular occurrence. And the story is commemorated in the statues on the eastern pediment of the temple. We see Onomaeus on one side and uh, Petlops on the other. Their horses and their chariots and um, some, I think there's some rivers there as well in the very corner sort of leading up. And one of the chariot guys is meant to be Mertelos as well, of course. Now with Heracles, 
As we read earlier, Heracles visited Elis to complete one of the tasks, which was to clear the stables of King Algis. And I've shown you this metope, the one we looked at earlier, where he is using a broom to try and get the rivers started, or at least using the broom to try and get rid of the disgusting dung that he has to sweep away. And Algius then refused to pay him, which he had promised to do once he completed the task, and Heracles swore revenge. So, after he had completed the 12 tasks, Heracles then came back with an army and took the city from Algius. You know, like I said before, he doesn't start fights, but he does end them. And then, having taken the city from Algius, he sets up an uh, the Olympic Games, or at least maybe he adds to the games that are already there because he also sets up an altar to Pelops and built six altars uh, which are there for the 12 Olympians. Uh, wait, go back and have a look at your map of Olympia that I gave you way back when in the first and second topic. Um, according to Pseudo Apollodorus, an ancient mythographer, this is what Heracles did. So we've got two stories about how the Olympic Games were set up and Heracles is responsible for one of them. So to finish off the Greek version of Heracles, what did he do next? So after completing the 12 labours, one story says that Heracles actually joined Jason and the Argonauts in their quest for the Golden Fleece. That's a whole nother story that it's such a shame we don't get to study, but it's really, really long. There are some excellent movies made about it, though. However, um, Herodorus, who wrote a history on Heracles around 400 BCE, yep, that's right, a history about a mythological character, disputed this and said, no, Heracles never sailed with the Argonauts, no. Again, what a joy kill, buzz kill, does one. A separate tradition, as in the Argonautica of Apoll Apollonius Rhodius, who is so like the, so it's the written down version of the um, Jason and the Argonauts story. It's really good, by the way. I highly recommend that. And that's from um, the third century uh, CE. Um, so much, much later. Uh, he has Heracles accompany the Argonauts, but he doesn't actually go with them as far as Colchis, where the Golden Fleece is. So he joins him for part of the journey. So there's a bit of a compromise and Heracles is pops up all over the place his sons pop up in the Aeneid some of them are nice some of them aren't um overall though after completing all of the impossible tasks of Eurystheus and doing some other stuff as well Heracles is finally rewarded by his father Zeus with immortality after his death he is deified Hera also finally forgives him for being born. Nice one. And to say sorry for being horrible to him for his whole life, he lets him marry her daughter Hebe in Olympus. And Hebe is a youth goddess and thus, you know, rather lovely prize for him. And apparently they live happily ever after as gods. There are further stories of Heracles, or, or Hercules rather, in the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses, and we shall be reading some of these in the Hercules topic that we're going to be doing after this topic. So I hope you look forward to those. And that's the end of this one. Gosh, that took a really long time. Um, stay tuned for Roman Hercules coming up when you finish this one. <laughs>